Hi there. My name is Omid. You guys can hear me okay? Awesome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I am a recovering software engineer. Uh, I used to build software for about 10 years of my life. Um, I built software for companies as small as one, two, three person startups. Uh, I built software for companies as large as Cisco, 80,000 plus employees. I built software for software developers. I've been exposed to some of the largest software deployments in the world, some of the most sophisticated largest software teams uh, on the planet. Uh, how many people here know how software is built? All right, good. Some of you, uh, your hands are not go up, so if you don't know how software is built, I'll explain to you how software is built. It's very important for the purpose of this talk on fake data. So software is built very similar to how I imagine a car is built. So uh, imagine, if you will, um, uh, a uh, automotive manufacturing uh, company building software. There's probably some small parts that are built at the very beginning of the process. These small parts are then pieced together into bigger parts, and the bigger parts are then pieced together into what eventually becomes a car, and then the car is shipped off into the hands of consumers, right? So software is built very similar, where you have a bunch of software engineers, very similar to everybody in this room, and everyone in this room is responsible for certain parts of that software feature infrastructure, and the pieces come together eventually into what is known as, in, this, in, in the software world, the CI-CD pipeline, the proverbial, uh, 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 conveyor belt, if you will. Those pieces are then put together into what eventually becomes a software, and then that shift off into production. So when you open up your phone on Facebook, you see all the latest, coolest features. Now, before a vehicle is shipped off into the hands of consumers, there's a particular QA process that it goes through. Uh, performance tests, security tests, safety tests, there's one particular test that we all know as consumers, the crash test. And in the process of the crash test, the vehicle is driven at a certain speed to simulate particular unfortunate crashes, certain angles. We're not testing the car per se. What we're testing is the car, the appliance in this case, against a particular payload, C data, an anthropomorphic test device to be exact, ATD. Fancy for a crash test dummy. Now the crash test dummy is designed to look, to feel, to behave, to mimic every single person in this room, right? It's designed to become like the average of everyone in this room. Now, we do our best to try to mimic an actual person, but it's not going to be an actual person. We get feedback, we get input, we get signals, we get data from this device. We then take that data back and then we fine tune the appliance, or in this case the car, uh, to adjust to then better match the payload, or the seed data, the crash test dummy. Now why do we use a crash test dummy? Why don't we use anybody else in this audience? What are some example, you know, cars that you drive? Give me a manufacturer. What's a car that you drive? Subaru. Subaru. And your name is? Brent. Brent? Imagine if Subaru called you and said, hey, Brent, we have a brand new car that's coming out to market. And with this car, it's like a next level generation of security features. It's a custom tailored car to the individual. So gone are the days of mass manufacturing vehicles hoping that the average of all the safety features are going to fit everybody. We're going to custom tailor all the security features to you. We're going we're to match your body, your height, your weight, how you react, your pre-existing conditions. Everything about this car is custom tailored to you. Sounds pretty cool. There's one catch. You have to sit behind the, the wheel of the car during a crash test and we're gonna run you into a wall at 65 miles per hour, and we're gonna quickly come over, and hopefully you're still alive, we say, Brent, how do you feel? Any broken bones? Okay, we see your ankle broke, so in this particular case, we're gonna make some adjustments. We gotta do another test to see if that worked. We're gonna keep testing and testing and testing. If we test you in this scenario, eventually you're not gonna survive. It's not safe, forget for the fact that it's, you know, illegal and unethical, but we're really pounding our consumer 
right, in this scenario. I mean, I mean, the simulation makes sense. Objectively speaking, let's be honest. If I were to custom tailor a vehicle and I used you as my seed data, I would have perfect 100% feedback. There's no bias being introduced into my crash test dummy. My crash test dummy is a guess to what I think that you will react. My hope that I'm simulating a scenario with payload data that will work when my car eventually goes out into production and faces similar scenarios. Now, going back to the software example, software is built in a very similar way to cars. So prior to software ending up in the hands of the consumers, there's a QA process. There's functional tests, integration tests, automation tests, unit tests, the list goes on forever. There's all kinds of tests that we run. We have a survey uh, that has given us some very interesting feedback. 39% of software engineers from some of the largest software deployments on the planet have admitted that they're using production data and testing. So they are doing the digital equivalent of putting their consumers behind their cars and running them into the wall. Imagine that for a second. So today, we're gonna to chat about fake data. What exactly is fake data? We have some of the brightest minds in the science of fake data that's gonna talk about the digital equivalent of a crash test dummy or an ATD. Um, we have April Spate, who's doing some amazing work in spatial computing at Microsoft uh, in the world of AR and VR. Uh, Andrew Columbi, PhD, CTO, co-founder, of uh, Tonic.ai, uh, who's revolutionizing the world of fake data, synthetic data, data synthesized from production, the crash test dummy of data for software engineers. Um, Sentil Padmanabhan from eBay, VP in engineering, tech lead fellow, who's gonna share with us what arguably is one of the soft, largest software deployments on the planet, uh, data in the petabytes, I can't even imagine. Um, so without further ado, I would love to welcome uh, April Sp Spate to the stage. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I think I'm going to be double mic'd here. Let me see if I should probably turn one of these off. Am I good? All right, awesome. Welcome, April. Thank you. All right, first question I want to ask you. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Uh, we see headlines about data hacks, uh, privacy, uh, identity theft. Do we have a problem in the world today? So I will say it depends. And so when it comes to what we see in the headlines, there's two different factors at play. One, it's more so the companies and what they're doing with our data. Is our data protected? Are there, fact are there internal factors within these companies to make sure that the correct people have access to data? Then on the other end, there's more so the consumer, us. What are we doing with our data? Are we providing access to our data? Are we providing consent? Are we being mindful of where we are providing consent? So there's really two factors there at play more so with regards to how people are getting access to our data and just ensuring that for at least our perspective, we're protecting it. From the company's perspective, they have things in place to make sure that data is being protected. So there's those two things that will contribute to just the state of where we are with having data protected. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So prior to me joining Tonic, um, I just kind of assumed as a consumer that my data is safe. I mean, I use, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of different brands. Every brand holds massive amounts of my personal data. And mm -hmm. I, I just give it up. Sometimes I'm asked for like my date of birth. And I'm like, sure, you probably need it for some reason. <laughs> yeah. You probably don't. Probably don't. And how concerned should we as consumers be as we interact with these brands, brand name companies, about the safety of our data today? Yeah, so we should be mindful of, to your point, what is being asked of us? 
And also, is that information even necessary as well? Now, there's some instances where, yes, you'll need to provide. And so if we think about the space in which I work, if we're talking about like AR apps, for example, if they are location-based, well, the app's not going to work if you don't provide your location. For instances like that, you need to provide it. However, if it's an app that's asking me to sign up and it wants to know my birth date, I really don't have a need to share that information. So therefore, it, it does depend on really analyzing why is this information necessary. And then from the company side, also just getting an idea of why are we collecting these data points from customers? Is this information necessary? How are we using it? Is it relevant to what we are doing? So therefore, it's that matter of really thinking, is this information something that we need to be uh, retrieving from people? And then from our end, do we need to share this information about ourselves? Do I need to enable um, my microphone, for example, while um, using an app or not? So it's, it's just really thinking about those things as you're, as you're engaging with these different platforms. As a, as, as a consumer, we kind of, you know, there's a, there's a particular social contract between myself as the consumer mm -hmm. and, and, and the corporate corporation and the governing bodies, GDPR, PCI, HIPAA, there's just an assumption, there's a public trust that's made that, that a company is taking their fiduciary duty seriously in protecting my data. Uh, we know that the data suggests that this is not true. Yeah. What's stopping companies from taking further steps in protecting consumer data? So I would say in terms of what's stopping, it would probably be the logistics behind what it entails to make sure that things are protected. And so if it, if it comes down to it, if it costs more money in terms of resources to make sure that there are certain factors um, accounted for and integrated, that's something that can unfortunately stop. Sometimes it's also a matter of who we're hiring to work on our teams. And so as much as we love to feel that we're vetting people that are being hired, you kind of really don't know what to expect until someone's working there. And that's where you come into instances where unfortunately data does get exploited, just purely from people who are your own personnel. And so uh, in some instances, when you have companies who are hiring fast because they need to get a product out the door, that's when things can unfortunately start to get a little loose. And then that's when you don't have all those checks and balances in place with regards to who's being hired or being able to actually put money towards the resources that are necessary to make sure that data is being protected as well. Are the options there, even if they wanted to, say, for example, hire the right type of person or have the right type of tools? Are the options there today? I feel that the options are there. It's just a matter of taking the effort to, um, to act on those to make sure that you're, you're doing that. And taking the effort is, is, is probably going to be prescribed by best practice, engineering practices, maybe even like the culture of the engineering team. Yeah. Um, does that impact how much effort is taken, I imagine? I think there is some impact there as well. And if we're thinking about it from a people perspective, there's also that education piece that's at play. There's a reason why different companies have these different modules that we go through in training to make sure that we are doing the right thing with data, that we are in compliance. And I know for some folks, they sit through these different informational trainings and they're just clicking away on the screen just to say, I completed this so I can get back to my work. And so while it may seem as though this is just a chunk of time that is eating up some, some time that I could be doing towards developing or programming, it's important to make sure that we're doing those things. There's a lot of important information in there. Companies invest the time and money to make sure that we're being provided these resources to understand the safety around data and what we should and shouldn't be doing. So with that said, there, there is that matter of ensuring that we are taking those things uh, seriously and necessary. But then also, if we do have workloads, just to be realistic, we're all busy at work, I'm assuming. And so if we do have heavy workloads, and then all of a sudden you get an email saying mandatory training, it does take a hit in terms of making sure that we're actually focusing on that and that we're tuned into it because there's just so many other things that we um, need to tend to. So unfortunately, it can be a bandwidth issue sometimes, just ensuring that we can get the training done. And uh, it's, it's being, being sure that people are provided that time to actually do things of that nature. And so that's what I feel when it comes to that. I think, I think by, by, by virtue of uh, the space that you work in and this exploding, uh, you know, new world of the metaverse, mm -hmm. it's inevitable that, 
you know, our lives are becoming more digital yeah. and inherently more and more of our data yes, is, is, also. Is, is now starting to go out there and, you know, into, into virtual environments and, and the cloud, right, as, mm -hmm. as, as, as we all know it. What particular insights or, or stories or anecdotes can, can you share from, from your unique perspective in this exploding space with uh, data privacy? Yeah, so for a bit of context, I do quite a bit of research around uh, privacy, safety, and DNI as it relates to XR development. So XR being extended reality development, that's the umbrella of everything between AR, VR, MR, and so on and so forth. And so in my research, I came across a article from the World Economic Forum. It was a hypothetical situation where there was a guy named Riley. He was playing a VR maze game and it was a multiplayer game. He was playing with some friends of his as well. And so the game itself, um, it, it tracked Riley's data. Riley uh, had applied for health insurance or I'm sorry, it was, um, yeah, I think it was health insurance. I think so, that's what it was. And unfortunately, um, the, uh, sorry, it was life insurance. That's why I was like, health insurance didn't make sense. It was life insurance. And his application got rejected. And he didn't quite understand why it got rejected. He had a clean bill of health, wasn't sure what was going on. And so from appealing it and going back and forth with regards to what happened, the insurance company had mentioned that um, they actually had received tracking data from the VR company that had the game. Unfortunately, that VR company was selling user data to multiple companies. And so based on what was tracked in that app, based on his movements, he showed early signs of dementia. And so therefore, application was rejected. And then months later, his sister also applied for life, um, life insurance, also rejected because dementia runs in the family. So those, those sort of situations, though that one in particular is hypothetical, this technology can actually track biometric data. It can track your, um, your torso and your head movements, your arm movements, so on and so forth. And so we don't necessarily in all cases know what's happening to that data when we're engaging in these sort of activities and these games. Now don't get me wrong, there, is actually, there are actually good cases in terms of why that information should be tracked, especially if we think about the medical field, which is definitely great. However, there are those instances where data is being or can be exploited. And so, um, although I really love the space that I'm in, as I tell people, it's not the technology that's gonna be the problem, it's the people. And what we're actually doing with the technology and just knowing that there's a lot that we can do and infer, we just have to be very mindful with regards to how we're engaging with these platforms, as well as who are we hiring to help build these platforms and who we're working with as well. Uh that scares me. It scares me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I imagine with most people, um, I've been on online since as early as I can remember. I mean, this entirely new generation uh, is, is entrusting their data. So to think that that data is being shared with insurance companies and decisions are being made on, 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 on data that may arguably have a bias uh, is, is scary. What kind of protection is out there from a regulatory perspective that could at least make me feel a bit better and motivate companies to do better? Yeah, so as we think of things such as GDPR, for example, um, because a lot of the data that we provide is personal identifiable information, so PII, and we do have an obligation to make sure that we are compliant with regards to the data that we are collecting. When I say we, I mean those of us who work in tech, for example, who have products. And so we do need to abide by those. Um, we need to make sure that we have measures in, um, in place internally if customers reach out and they say, please remove my data from your database. I remember going through an exercise um, for when GDPR became the big thing that everyone was trying to hurry up and get ready for and making sure that we had processes in place if we got those requests or if someone were to ask, what do you have on me? And it's, it's, it's a lot of work that needs to go in place for doing that, but we also need to make sure that we are adhering to it because there are a lot of negative consequences if, um, if, if you are using people's data in the wrong manner, especially if it's in a way that people have not consented to in terms of having their data used. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, think, I think it's fair to say that's a good segue into talking about what, what fake data is yeah. and, how, and, and how it helps. So with that, I'd love to welcome uh, Andrew Columbi, CTO, co-founder of uh, Tonic.
uh, wherever you'd like. I think, yeah, that's a good spot. Sure, yeah. Welcome, welcome, Andrew. All right. All right. First question, what is fake data? Okay, <laughs> what is fake data? I mean, it sounds like a simple question, right? But it's actually a very not so simple answer. I think the thing that across all the possible answers to what is fake data, there's this idea of we have some sort of source data set, some original data set, and then we want to create another data set that is simultaneously similar enough to the source that you can't distinguish the two, but then also definitely not the source, because if it was the source, then you know, it wouldn't be fake. So there's these two competing needs that are happening when people think about fake data. Um, and then within that, though, it's like really depends on what your use case is, who you are, why you want this fake data. Like, if you're on a DevOps team trying to help developers build software, your needs for fake data are, are very different than if you are, uh, say, a machine learning practitioner that wants to be able to train, data, uh, train models using different data. And then the kinds of fake data that you need, it, it varies very wildly. Like, it can be as simple as, oh, I need some fake social security numbers. Easy. I got three digits, I got a dash, I got two digits, I got a dash, I got four digits. I can do this. But um, when it comes to more sophisticated things, like let's say I have data on, uh, we'll go to the health example, I have data on um, people that are in a study around heart disease, right? So for me to create good fake data, around people in a study on heart disease, I need to understand what are the precursors to heart disease. What are the, what are the different factors that are gonna play into uh, a person that indicates they have heart disease or doesn't have heart disease? That's gonna have to be in my fake data, otherwise it's not gonna be useful for you know, studies uh, on the data or, or that kind of thing. So yeah, you know, I think the answer to what is fake data depends on who you are and what you need. But broadly under all of that is this idea that I'm going to simultaneously have data that looks really similar to the original data, but isn't so similar that I'm revealing sensitive information about kind of where the data came from. You know, how did the data get derived? Andrew, it, 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 it doesn't sound like it's a hard problem to solve. It's mm. fake data. Like yeah. some scripts, just spin something up, yeah, yeah. have some monkey sit there and tap on a computer, yeah. right? And just use that. Why is this a hard problem to solve for? Yeah. Um, I've worked at Tonic now for like, uh, we founded it four years ago. And by the way, we're hiring. If anyone <laughs> wants to bake fake data with me, please give me your resume. Uh, but um, yeah, in my time at Tonic, I kind of have seen two different, uh, two different like, responses, two different attitudes towards fake data. Why is it, what's going on here? One attitude is, Oh, you know, I've never tried this before. It seems like it's not so bad, though. Like, right, I'm going to make some fake strings. I got some random number integer generator. I, I can do a normal distribution. Um, and then there's engineers who've tried, and they're like, mm-mm, damn near impossible. Like, can't be done. And um, I think once you try, you learn what that difficulty is. And it's the stories that are in the data. Like, real data has really interesting, intricate stories that just fit together so perfectly that it couldn't be anything but real. Uh, and just to give an example of that, back to healthcare data, because healthcare data really is like some of the hardest data to create fake data for. Um, let's just look at like a patient in the claims data. Claims data is like anytime you go to a doctor, they write down everything they've done, you know, whether it's a, a surgery or a, gave you a pill or put ear, you know, something in your ear, whatever. It's all marked down in the data. And uh, if you look at like a patient and you look at their, their claims data, there's gonna be all these little stories in it, like the story of a guy who had an accident while skiing, went to an orthopedic surgeon, that orthopedic surgeon recommended some imaging so they get an MRI, then they do a post uh, MRI meet, then they do a pre-op meet, then they do the operation, then they do the post-op operation. All this is like an episode in the life of the patient. And beyond that, there's going to be maybe, you know, 10 years later, they get a knee replacement because of your arthritis that's in. It's all part of, like, real, uh, you know, the real data is going to have all those intricate things. And by the way, that's just one story of the patient. The patient has other stories that are happening interweaving throughout the data as well. Like, uh, maybe they go to a dermatologist or they get strep throat and they go and they get, you know, um, antibiotics. All these data 
are in the patient's history, the patient's real data, and that's just one kind of story in the claims data. You can kind of flip the claims data and imagine the doctor's stories, right? There's an orthopedic surgeon. He sees people for uh, a few visits before he never sees them again, hopefully, unless he has more orthopedic surgeon needs. Um, or maybe you're talking about a GP. A GP, they see the same patients over years and years and years about lots of different things. Um, or an oncologist that might see a patient for a couple years. And so there are simultaneously these stories about the patients and these stories about the doctors, and they're interweaved together to form this beautiful tapestry of what real data looks like. And if you try to make a computer do that, it's just really, really hard. Like, on the one hand, you might say, okay, well, I'll teach the computer by hand. I will uh, go in and say, okay, there are these kinds of doctors, uh, there are these kinds of patients, there are these kinds of medical needs, uh, and I'm gonna have them perfectly interweave together uh, and create data that looks just like that. And I'll tell you from experience, that's impossible. Like, you can't teach a computer every single little nuance of data like that. On the other hand, you might say, okay, well, I can't teach the computer, so I'll have the computer learn itself, right? That's machine learning approach. I'm going to you know, try to present the computer with the data necessary to create the fake data uh, from a machine learning approach. And that is an, very much an active area of research. Like, this is not a solved problem. There are a few subdomains that are really cool that have more solved, uh, like have solved this problem. Just one example is, um, uh, what's it called? It's a website. It's like, I'm a fake person or something. If you look up on Google, I'm a fake person or this is not a real person, you'll find this website and it creates these stunning images of people that don't exist. You'll look at an image of the face of a person and you'll be like, surely this person exists. No, this person does not exist. Uh, and uh, yeah, so some areas are solved, but like healthcare, there are whole startups that are just focused on the healthcare, synthetic healthcare data, and it's not a solved problem. Some of the largest companies in the world arguably have like unlimited resources, unlimited cash, unlimited teams, unlimited computer science yeah. uh, professionals. Yeah. Why is it so hard for them to solve it for it themselves in-house? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a variety of things that go into why it's so hard. I mean, I just talked about the modeling problem. Actually, I should have concluded that, sentence, that last answer with a little, one more tidbit. All I talked about there was how to make sure the data looks good, right? There's a whole other problem of how do you make sure the data is private? And that's a whole other area of mathematics. Uh, there's a field called differential privacy. I uh, recommend you go to Wikipedia and type differential privacy if you want to have your math intake for the day. Um, but yeah, on why it's hard, on why, on why corporations don't do it right today, I mean, there's a variety of different reasons there. The modeling challenge is really hard. The privacy challenge is really hard. Um, and then there are also just practicalities like silly practicalities about why people don't invest in this. Just as an example, you know, you're a startup or a, a young company, you start and you say like, I'm a Postgres shop, we're gonna use Postgres every damn day, we love Postgres, and then a couple years later, you're really successful and you acquire another company that had the same feelings that you have about Postgres on MySQL. And so now you have MySQL and Postgres, and of course you have a data warehouse and a data lake, these are different systems, uh, maybe you have some MongoDB in there too, what I'm trying to say is the data ecosystem that every company experiences is pretty broad. And to be able to create a system that handles all of these different uh, kinds of data or data systems, it's just a slog. And so, you know, companies, even if they have the best intentions, they end up with bespoke pieces for uh, different, you know, different solutions for different things, and they don't work well together. So it's just, a, you know, it's a kind of a disheartening amount of work that needs to be done, and it's not where you want to spend your time as a company, right? Like if you're, you know, an e-commerce company, the last thing you want to be doing is spending all your engineering effort on data privacy and uh, synthetic data, and like handling all the nuances of all these different databases and how that's going to interact with with the fake data that you want to create. Um, so you know, it, it, it's just I think it's an area that. Uh, what happens is the company's never tried before, and they think this is easy. They try, and then they think it's impossible, and they give up. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, that's where companies like uh, Tonic comes in. And we're not the only company, by the way, doing this stuff. I think it's a really um, a, an open area with lots of R&D going into it right now, and, um, and the, the people that win there are going are gonna, to, you know, have a lot of, uh, they're going to have a lot of money <laughs> because there's going to be a lot of success and a lot of opportunity there. April, you're, you're at Microsoft. 
Is that true? Is it a hard problem to solve for? It's true. I'm at Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Not a hard problem for Microsoft to solve for. Yeah, I can't speak to too much in terms of what our data team does since I work in the area of mixed reality. So I'm not sure if I can answer that one necessarily. Fair. Uh, I, I, will say, I will say this, um, that the differential privacy, which is one of the core mathematical tenets today on, on uh, privacy, came out of Microsoft um, in 2006. Uh, Microsoft Research was the, uh, the, the inventors. I mean, I don't know, do you invent math or do you discover math? I think it's like one of the world's fundamental questions. Stay I think tuned for it. our next session at South by Southwest next year. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question to pose. <laughs> I would love to segue into a company who has solved for this, uh, VP in Engineering, Centil from eBay. Welcome, welcome, Centil. Uh, Centil, eBay is one of the largest software deployments on the planet. I was, I was using eBay before I even have a driver's li I had a driver's license. Uh, I now use it to uh, purchase um, very old baseball cards during COVID, a hobby that I picked back up. <laughs> yeah, trading cards are uh, the number one category in eBay at this point in time. Very, very interesting. How does, how does customer data play a role in your use of fake data? See, like many other organizations, right, customer data is key to everything we do. So eBay is an e-commerce marketplace. Um, so listings is at our core. Everything uh, in our world revolves around items. Uh, but uh, we also care about the humans associated with the items, right, the buyer and the seller. Um, and that uh, addresses the core value of eBay, which is to connect people and economically empower them. So these three data entities, which is the listing, then the seller who lists them and the buyer who buys them. And the relations to a ship together is what is everything about eBay. That's what has enabled us to build a global marketplace, and that's what has enabled us to run a successful business. Uh, of course, in an e-commerce world, there are many other auxiliary information that's needed, uh, but, uh, but everything revolves around these three, and uh, that's where we start. What, what role does fake data play in you and your engineering team? How many engineers do you guys have it? Thousands, I imagine? I mean, the eBay employee count is 14,000, of which uh, I, I a couple of thousand engineers. So. Did I get that right? Your data is in the petabytes? Yes, that's true. So I imagine fake data has utility for thousands of engineers right. trying to recreate a staging environment with petabytes of data in production. Right. right? How, does, how does fake data play a role in, in, in that pre-production process? So I, do, I have to give you some context here. So what happened is two years before, uh, we ran a developer survey at eBay. And the survey was to understand the developer pain points, like uh, what's happening to developers, are there any frustrations? Um, and our idea is to give a, get a sense of how developer productivity is going on on eBay, because we thought the release velocity in eBay was not in the scale where we wanted it to be. And that was what our primary motive was to do this developer survey. We did the survey across all the engineers across the company. And the top concern that came out of the survey was that eBay had a broken staging environment. Staging is the environment where you go and test your software before it goes to production. And that environment was broken and unreliable. So that's what started this whole process for us. Okay, something is broken. I mean, eBay had been having the staging environment from day one, since its inception. Uh, but somehow it has not been taken care of and it was not in a good place. So we acknowledged the issue and then we started a deep dive into it and we found out that the problems were twofold. The first was, the top complaint from the engineers was staging data was useless. There was nothing there. Um, I think prolonged misuse of the environment resulted in this data in the test environment to be very futile and prosaic. Uh, a, a real example I can give is when uh, two years back, when you go and search for boy shoes in our test environment, you'll get thousands of results. But all of them will have the same title, same image, same price. There is no variety or anything in here. And that's not how we do testing. Because if I just test on that, that my software will have bugs to go to production. So it was absolutely prosaic. Yes, there were terabytes of data, but it was pretty much useless. And the second issue was about uh, our infrastructure was uh, unpredictable. And that was at the hardware and network and all those things. So we heavily debated on this. Uh, we, in fact, also thought, should we just abandon staging environment? Why don't we directly test in production? Like some companies are doing it, and we just outlined about that process here. Uh, because maintaining an environment is hard, and it's expensive, and I mean, there's a cost associated with it. Uh, but that's where context matters. Uh, see, eBay is uh, e-commerce, and there is transactions involved. And whenever there is transactions involved, there is payments involved. 
uh, and we are talking about real transactions between genuine buyers and sellers with real items. And the margin of error has to be tiny there. I mean, you cannot go and assume your software works and do a transaction between two items, and that becomes buggy. And you can do read-only use cases, uh, but if you do a mutation, you are in trouble. Uh, but even doing read-only use cases will end up in trouble because if you, let's say you execute thousands of test cases, it creates uh, data dimensions in your, uh, in your analytics, which is best, you're just doing testing. It's not real uh, user interaction. Um, so com considering all this, we decided to fix st uh, staging. So how do we fix data? Uh, again, a uh, uh, thing when we talked about it is uh, the question that people asked, hey, why don't you create the data? Like, like you can just create the data for testing. Uh, and uh, that's how a lot of companies do. There are services, APIs for it. Why don't you go and create them? Uh, this is where the devil is in the details. Or it's, this is an easier said than done thing, right? Um, see, it's humanly impossible for us to create these thousands of combinations of listings that are there uh, on site for us to, in our test environment. You can create monotonous data in large quantities. But let's say you want to create an item with uh, 20 SKUs. Each SKU has a valid image with a 30-day return policy and international shipping enabled. That sort of creation is tricky, and it's really, really hard. Uh, and that's where you need for testing, right? For, for you to execute your P1 test cases to go to production, you need data like this sort. So we figured out, OK, that's not going to happen. In fact, we have tried it in the past. It did not work out. Um, so the solution we came up was this, right? Why don't we take a, a subset of data from our production move to staging in a privacy-preserving way. eBay has 1.5 billion listings in production. It's a huge number. Just a tiny subset, even 0.1% of that, should be sufficient to cover all our test cases. Um, and um, so fortunately for us, uh, listings is public information, because an iPhone is an iPhone, a shoe is a shoe, and whatever. But the buyer and seller associated with them is where privacy has to be associated, like, taken care of. Um, and uh, talking about privacy, that's something that we deeply care about, and that's one of our core values. Um, so, and, um, so when we were having this conversation, it was only we started partnering with Tonic and said, okay, let's work with Tonic and see how we can get this high quality data for our engineers and we can always guarantee them privacy. And that's how the fake data story came into eBay. Thank you for sharing that. I have, um, I have had conversations with heads of engineering, VPs of engineering, right. and I imagine some of us probably in, in our organizations and our, our colleagues, people probably in the audience too. I'm curious to hear if this is the case where the argument is that using, using production data is the best practice, not using production data is, is the anti-pattern, right? So I'm curious to know, as I guess for everybody on the panel, is have you had these conversations in the past with, with, with anybody and how do, you, how do you handle that conversation? Uh, it, it's a conversation that you need to ask on, I mean, putting the customer hat also in, in your place, right? I mean, is this data that is somewhat uh, customer related and then you can just send it across to your things, right? I mean, even in listings, right? For example, a reserve price is private data. Max bid price is private data. Like, this is all the things that you can, although it's listing associated, you cannot even expose that information to your developer environment because that's like you're faking the system, right? Like, I, I, if I know my max bid price, then that's what I'll go and bid for an item. And that, that's, that's, that's not ethical. Uh, I think these sort of conversations come into play, and that's how you should just, I mean, blanket say that production data is sacred, like that's what customers are entrusting you with, and don't go and play around with it, and then you give this data that is anonymized to your developers, and then that, that gives them an infinite playground to do whatever they want. You don't have these restrictions. Uh, I will, oh, I'll add to that as well, because I forgot to mention that earlier, but to um, Santil's point, it also it becomes a matter of, why do developers need access to our data? Why do they need to know where I live? Why do they need to know my phone number? That information really should just live with the sales team, for example. They're the ones that, or customer service, they're the ones that I actually, as a customer, interface with. There's no reason that your intern needs to know that information. There's no re reason that your most senior developer or engineer needs that information. So I think it's also an access thing that can also be a problem as well. And so that's why having production data available to just anyone, it's not lowering or it's not mitigating risk. It's actually increasing that risk because now more people who don't need that access has it. And, that, right. and that's a problem as well. Thank you for sharing that. I want to be mindful of time. C can we circulate a wireless mic in case there's questions in the audience? Show of hands. I can walk around. Yeah, perfect. I'll do that. Uh, yeah, the mic right there. I think I saw a hand back. Oh, there's a mic right here. That's on. Perfect. I actually have two questions. Um, I'm curious. Uh, 
with respect to Microsoft, that, that uh, example with the insurance company is really insidious. Um, and it occurs to me that I'm, I'm just not sure the consent process could ever solve for that. Mm -hmm. You know, a really popular video game and deep in the uh, terms of, of service, it says, oh, by the way, yeah. I'm just not sure that will ever work. And then I'm going to just sneak in one more question, um, and you guys can decide if, if this is too many questions. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on the current debate about differential privacy used for the U.S. Census. Mm. I don't know if you're aware of that. You want to start with yeah, can you repeat the first question? I, re I recall you saying that whether consent is actually like a foolproof plan in terms of Do you think of consent is, like it's not clear to me that right. consent can really be useful for the kind of scenario that you're talking right. about. Right, okay, I see what your question is. Yeah, so personal opinion, I feel as though, although consent is not a foolproof plan to ensure that our data is being protected, uh, there is the matter of legal action can take place on, you know, if, if we find that our data is being used in a manner that it should not uh, necessarily be used. And if you browse headlines or search, you've probably come across instances where people have sued companies with regards to how their data is being uh, used. In addition to that, it's also a matter of knowing what we're consenting to, because there's a lot of legalese that goes into consent forms that are signed. Um, it, unfortunately, it's also there to kind of trip some of us up, so we don't quite know what we're agreeing to as well. But that's where, as a consumer, we, we do need to be mindful with regards to what we are signing um, away on because there are instances where we're signing that, yes, I agree to, have to um, agree this for this company to sell my data to you know, their third-party vendors that they use. And so with that said, um, yes, it is unfortunate that that does happen, but there is, there is a manner of knowing that, hey, we're signing something that we need to be very mindful of, but also knowing that, yes, legal action can take place, though, when there, when there happens to be a breach in, uh, in contract as well. So while consent forms might not be the, um, the end-all, be-all, there, there are some repercussions that can take place if there happens to be a breach, but we just do need to be mindful of what we are signing, um, signing for as well. And I'll hand to you for the other question. Yeah, sure. I'm not particularly familiar with the, the, like the, I know that the census used differential privacy this time around. I'm not particularly familiar with what the, the controversy might be there, but I will say this. Differential privacy is a mathematical definition of privacy, and it might not match your intuitive definition of privacy. It's, it's very much a mathematical definition of privacy, and a, a way to think about that, um, just as an example, is uh, suppose you're a smoker, Everyone knows you're a smoker because you smoke and it's a thing that you see in public. Um, there might be a database that contains health outcomes for smokers, and it might be differentially private, protected with differential privacy. Nevertheless, you're going to be able to conclude from that database, even with differential privacy, that smokers have bad health outcomes. And everyone knows you're a smoker. So has your privacy been breached by that database? That now everyone knows that you have bad health outcomes probably in your future? Um, I think you could argue that that database did breach your privacy. On the other hand, following the tenets of differential privacy, that database is a private database. And uh, maybe I'll conclude that by saying, um, give an intuition of what differential privacy means, because I've been talking about it, and you probably, many of you probably don't know what it, what it may mean. And if you know a lot about differential privacy, this might cause you to cringe, so I'm sorry. Um, so uh, what differential privacy says is that an algorithm that has differential privacy won't be unduly impacted by one individual's data. So if you are part of the data that gets processed by that algorithm and you're just one individual, your data in particular won't have a massive impact on the algorithm's output, which means that in some sense your privacy is protected because you as an individual aren't having a big impact. Now of course, as we know for smokers, it's a very robust trend that smokers have bad health out outcomes, so your presence as an individual smoker in there isn't gonna make a difference on the outcome, like the, the conclusions that you can draw from that database. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's the particular, uh, if that's related to the, the controversy right now with using differential privacy in the census, but I do wanna remind folks, it's a mathematical definition of privacy and it might not match what feels like private to you. Yeah, good question. 
This is more in regards to testing and using test data in the healthcare domain. So my clients are, like they have healthcare claims in unstructured formats like MongoDB, multi uh, document, embedded document kind of formats, and we're moving to the cloud. So you have the option of having like field level encryption, which is very difficult to <laughs> to implement, and then you could use that test data possibly theoretically, but there's risk. Um, but in terms of generating test data, is what solutions do you think are there for companies like that that want to test at volume, large volume data into like say Atlas or to AWS and without exposing their existing production data that has, that's PHI data and various levels of PII? Yeah, uh, I know that eBay has been working with document data um, uh, as well, but in terms of what technologies exist, I mean, um, I, I don't know, well, I feel kind of bad plugging my own company, but Tonic does have a MongoDB connector. We re released it about a year ago now, so it's, it's, it's more mature. Um, sorry? Is the website? What's the website? Is yeah. that true? Uh, Tonic.ai. Uh, Tonic, okay. Tonic.ai, yeah. Tonic. It's spelled just how you think it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, generally speaking, you know, document data, creating fake document data is actually a pretty big challenge uh, because of its semi-structured nature. Uh, there isn't as clear a format that you can fit the data to, and so you have to be, uh, yeah, you have to be clever about how to create document data. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. No, uh, I, th I think on top of it, you should also have uh, the domain, a sort of a DSL uh, implementation, a domain-specific language that... Uh, your corporation uh, does it. So in our case, when we, are sta we started with Oracle, which was very structured as a SQL, and then when we went to Mongo, there is this document storage where things were all embedded in, in a logic within the document itself where we had to add our own adapters to it. And that's when your company or the, the like eBay, for example, were giving inputs to Tonic on how, how we can do that. So it's a combination of both. In, in, in a structured data databases like Oracle, it gets more easier and straightforward. Um, in in document-based storage, it's, uh, it's uh, tricky, and you've got to have both sides involved. what the performance is in the cloud with large amounts of multi-document embedded data, at, you know, healthcare. So we can't just pour it over stuff without the CEO having a heart attack, you know, <laughs> and going to the cloud and then like it's for some reason it's unsecure. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a use case that we do see. Um, you know, it's like, we want to test out the cloud, but we also don't trust the cloud. How do we test the cloud without trusting the cloud? Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a thing that we've seen um, our customers come to us for. There was um, a question yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead. <laughs> Hello. I just want to say um, thank you for this talk. This has been very eye-opening in ways that we see data developing, especially um, I visited that site, the people that don't exist, those people look very real. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, and I'm looking to work in the music industry on the label side, so I'm very interested how that will integrate into streaming in regards to, I guess, gaining momentum for following other stuff. But especially, do you think in the future there would possibly be fake like artists? So is that like a thing now? Like fake, like fake music artists or fake like uh, fake? Video yeah, like artists, all of it. Fake artists and like just fake data, just going. You know, I, fake. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with no, and I'm a hot take no, uh, because there was a person behind that. You know, like just because um, a computer made that face, there were tons of researchers. I think it's Nvidia that did that work. Uh, StyleGAN, I believe, is the name of the product project. Um, or like, take a look at uh, if you want your mind blown again. Um, there's this, there's a open AI, they have a product called GPT-3 that came after GPT-2 um, that's a um, fake English language creator. And they create fake, uh, they've created fake news articles um, and they'll give it a little seed, like they'll say, researchers find unicorns in Peru. And then it will create a whole article about researchers finding unicorns in Peru. And I'm not even kidding. I think this guy's nodding because he's seen that article. Have, have you seen it? Yeah, exactly. Yep, it's there. Um, so, 
So I'm going to go with no, though, because like, yeah, a computer created the face or a computer created the story, but a human created the computer that created the face. Huh? So uh, that, that, that's, kind of why, that's kind of why I say no. Um, and I think of it almost like, I mean, I'm a musician uh, and also a computer programmer, and sometimes I think about how I could have the computer create more of the music, and I think of it like a tool, like a paintbrush, rather than uh, like a simulacrum of me that's going to just be there and like virtual Andrew composer. Thank you so much. Hi there, my name is uh, Chris Smith and I work in a highly regulated data space, FICRA data in particular, so you can imagine who I might work for, one of the big three in the day. Um, and one of the things that we do is we tell clients who want to store our data for analytics purpose that they have to make it anonymous and they have to keep data separated. So if you have psychodemographic and you have regulated data, you can do what you need to do, but you gotta keep it separated and then it must be anonymous. So when I think about the cost associated with a testing environment that you want to avoid, I'm trying to understand why not just take the same approach with using real data but make it anonymous so you can do what you have to do in production versus a staging environment. So as a budding entrepreneur, I start thinking about these things when I have my own ideas of trying to create something and test it out and move it in production. And when you say cost, I get concerned. But if you make it anonymous, then what's the, what's the challenge with using anonymous data in production if it's, if it's been being done today by highly regulated in, in industries? So, so, uh, your go ahead. Uh, no, so your point is that you're saying that why can't we just take the subset in production and use the production data itself anonymized and do all your testing over there? That's right. I think that's a very good point. And uh, since eBay already had a staging environment, we did that. Uh, but let's say we never had a staging environment and uh, we just had one environment like production. Right. That could be one possible option where we can just take the production and put it inside the production itself um, and try to do that. But having said that, there are also compliance and regulations. Right? If, if you are a publicly traded company, for example, eBay for that matter, there are so many guidelines on how you access a production environment. That's right. Especially when you are a payments company like eBay. Right. Um, so so uh, whether all the checklist will be satisfied on us going and playing on a production zone itself is a big is a question mark. I don't know the answer for to that. Yeah. Uh, so if that checklist is getting satisfied, then you're right. Then I don't need a staging environment. I can just create a zone like a sort of a, right. a, a carve out in the production area and then uh, anonymize the data and then play around with that. That's, that's totally possible. And create a separate team who only has access to the anonymous absolutely. data. Absolutely. They can't touch anything else, right? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yep. All right, thank you. The problem with that approach is that you manipulate the production data. No, but, but it's going to sit in a different data source inside the production zone. Like it's, it's going to carve out the data space inside production zone itself. Mm. Cool. As, as with any tech, um, once you've solved it, then people are going to like misuse it. <clears throat> Has anyone talked about, hey, can I create this fake data, but can I fingerprint it to make sure it never gets out in the wild and used to like fluff numbers? And you know, I've got all these, you know, Twitter followers as, as, as well. So like DLP fingerprinting technologies on top of making sure it's completely anonymous. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. It's like, what are the misuses of fake data? I'm so focused every day on like, how do I solve the world's problems with fake data? I don't think about like, what problems am I creating with fake data? Uh, yeah, any, any, any thoughts on? So, so since it's anonymized, right? Uh, yeah. How, what is the worst outcome? Well, the worst outcome would be like. Well, you mentioned uh, like fake news. People yeah, are using fake this news today. Or like, or like they're what using these tools today. Is there a way like news? So I'm a news redistributor. Is there a way can I detect this tool was right. used to create it? But the data still has all the properties to solve the testing problem. Right. And do you regulate that? There's which whole... makes his job 10 times harder, which is right. cool. <laughs> it's already a hard problem. Um, well, I think, I think yeah. if, if, if I may. It, it depends on the approach. With Tonic specifically, we, we synthesize it from production. So that there has to have been something to exist in the real world for us to synthesize a data set that looks, acts, and feels like that thing. I think that the abuse comes from when you arbitrarily create from scratch that could be misconstrued as real, which I think is the, 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 the danger. But hypothetically, any tool that's used in the wrong way, I suppose, I, I haven't seen one where Tonic was used in the wrong way, but you're not creating data from scratch, if that makes sense. I, I'm in the public safety realm, and uh, this question is for April or anybody else who may have something to add to it. Uh, when it comes to providing fake data, have you had any, 
is there any way to verify the, the systems that are feeding into your system from, from other vendors pro providing erroneous information that they're using your product to inflate numbers of use without having to go through the typical uh, opt-in, opt-out, <clears throat> which is confusing in itself because I, I don't know what I'm opting in of or out of anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you seen it where other systems are feeding to your systems from a client user perspective that drives your rates up when, they're act when it's all fake? It's not coming in from a reliable source. I'm just curious. That is a really good question. I do not have an answer um, necessarily. What I can say, a lot of what I've done with data was pre-Microsoft. And so it was back when I worked more so in the um, AMS world, so association management um, systems as well as, uh, as CRMs. And so I don't unfortunately quite have an answer for that one. All right. Thank you. Before we end, I do have a question I want to ask the audience. If you're willing to admit software engineers or developers or anybody for that matter, have any of you worked with production live customer data within a testing context? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Good number. Yeah, yeah. It kind of mimics what our survey is, 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 is showing. It's, it's like roughly like one fourth of the world is, seems to ha work with actual customer data in a context that they shouldn't be, which as a consumer, to be honest, freaks me out. Yeah. Uh, I believe we are at time. I'd love to chat some more. I can't thank you all enough, especially the panel. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for coming out.